So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Liz Hoy. She's a, a she's a scientist at NASA Goddard in the in the Carbon Cycle and Ecosystem Office, and she provides a, a variety of different science support activities to the above field campaign that's been going on, uh, I guess, since um, well for the last four or five years, maybe longer. Um, <laughs> She has a PhD in geographical science from the University of Maryland, and she studied while she was there and, and still now studies landscape ecology and dis disturbance regimes within boreal forests in North America. And she's typically uses uh, ge geospatial data and remote sensing to understand fire regimes and impacts uh, on the carbon cycle in boreal forests. So with that, I'll let Liz take it away. Great, thanks, Mike. I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Everyone can hear me and see my screen. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. Yeah. So, uh, so first, I want to just introduce kind of our leadership team and above. And um, so, Mike is part of that. Mike and Hank Margolis are from the NASA Terrestrial Ecology Program. Scott Getz is our science team lead, Northern Arizona University. Chip Miller, deputy science lead, and then Peter Griffith is the kind of the project manager coordinator, um, and he's the lead of the NASA Carbon Cycle and Ecosystems Office, which is where I sit at NASA Goddard. Okay. So many of you might be familiar with ABOVE, so I won't dwell on this much, but I just wanted to set the stage for what ABOVE is, and then we're going to delve into some highlights from this summer. So ABOVE is a large-scale study of environmental change in Arctic and boreal regions and the implications for ecological systems and society. Our overarching question deals with the vulnerability and resilience of these systems to environmental change in Arctic and boreal regions in Western North America. Currently, our science team has 87 NASA-funded projects. There are um, 67 that are, that are kind of NASA above projects and 20 other NASA projects. And we have 22 affiliated projects and two partner projects, one, one from um, DOE NG and one from uh, Polar Knowledge Canada. Uh, there are 90 project leads, 723 science team members, and over 1,300 participants, so somehow people who are associated with the, with the campaign itself. Um, you can find us on our website, on Twitter, on Facebook, and uh, Peter Griffith updates those pretty frequently for us. And this is just a, a, screen, or a picture from our last Above Science Team meeting, which was this past May, just showing we have we have many. This is only two people per project came, and we still had a huge a huge showing there. Above is really trying to go from scaling observations from the leaf to the orbit. So if you look at the right side of the diagram, you'll see we are taking measurements at the leaf level. We're going all the way up to the airborne and then to the satellite level, and then we are incorporating modeling work into this as well. And it's really all brought together with this framework, looking at causes of change, changes to ecosystems, yeah, ecosystem services, and then social systems. How do they all fit together in uh, Western North America, Alaska, and Western Canada? Let's see. So as we get started, I'm going to first just show a little bit about um, what some of the field teams are doing, and then what some of the airborne measurements that we were making are this past summer. And then I'm going to take you, we're going to fly through the domain and look at a few kind of locations, and then, uh, and then we're going to summarize at the end. So I'm going to start here by just showing some of the sites and measurements that are being made across the domain in 2019. And I will say that this, this picture is um, it's updated by investigators as they as they get to update it, and I help them to get some of this information in here. So this is not a, a complete list. We have rolling updates uh, pretty regularly. You can re anyone can go into our website and look at this planning tool and see what measurements we are planning on making as part of above. This shows 17 different projects that uh, have some type of measurement that's being made across the domain in the year of 2019. And I would say that that is pretty close to how many teams we actually had out this past summer. There were between kind of 15 and 20 teams, depending on how you count a team. You know, if you have two PIs but one group going out, that kind of thing. So, how do we summarize that in 15 minutes? So we're gonna we're gonna give it a try. So this just shows that there are a lot of different measurements being made across the domain, and if you want to drill down into what type of measurement it is, you can do that. 
on our system. We make measurements across six different uh, themes, looking at permafrost, hydrology, carbon dynamics, uh, wildlife and ecosystem services, um, disturbance, and uh, let's see, flora fauna. So uh, really a host of, of um, science themes and measurements that are being made across the domain. In addition to that, we had an, an airborne campaign this past summer. We had three different uh, airborne instruments making measurements throughout the domain for multiple months of the summer. We had L-band radar measurements, which is the UAV SAR program, and then we had AVERS Next Generation members, uh, measurements, which is a hyperspectral instrument, and then ELVIS measurements, which is a LIDAR instrument. And um, on the left there is just some, some photos from the, from the airborne campaign. Uh, people like to see pictures of airplanes, right? And if you can find me, where's Waldo? I'm in one of those pictures. I'm actually I'm down on the bottom left. I, uh, I got a chance to fly with the plane, this, with the L-band instrument this summer, and um, that, was, that was really great. I got to do some field work coincident with the airplane, and um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So I'm going to show you where the airborne measurements took their measurements, or where the airborne measurements were made this past summer, and then we'll go into some of our some of the field team work uh, coincident with those with those measurements. So this is the L-band instrument, and you can actually see this radar instrument. It's it's uh, on the bottom of this of the plane here. Um, it's this kind of white pod below the plane, and it's sending down the radar signal. And you can see on the right here the different swaps that we where we collected data. And this was done in uh, August and September of 2019. This year, where these are all of the swaps where we collected data. At the end of the presentation, I'll show you a link where you can go to actually find all of the data that's been collected as part of above. Um, NASA makes that imagery or that all of those measurements available uh, so that researchers can use them. And as some of our scientists make higher level products out of these radar measurements, we will make those available as well. And it will all be accessible through the link at the end of the presentation. So Avarice Next Generation measurements were also made. This is a a hyperspectral instrument, and uh, this is just another screenshot of our of our study domain. 27 science flight days, 129 flight hours, over 193 lines acquired, and 1,500 uh, kilometers, 1,500,000, 15,000 sorry kilometers flown. So it was a major effort this summer. And these the red dots show actually the acquisitions from 2017 and 19 combined. Um, but the numbers are from just 2019 alone. And then this is the LIDAR instrument, ELVIS. And uh, you can see here that there's just, uh, we flew many parts of the domain this summer. We, uh, we, we selected our locations based on where we knew uh, field teams were interested in measurements or where we overflew um, ISAT-2 transects. We also overflew um, areas where LIDAR has been collected in the past, such as 10 years ago, so that one of our uh, above scientists is actually going to be doing a, a biomass change map, so to look at what was the biomass 10 years ago, what is it now, and you can use the LIDAR data to kind of understand the, the biomass, the structure of the, of the forest. So, uh, so that's why some of these lines look a little strange, as we were trying, we really were trying to uh, work out and fly specific locations. So what we're going to do next is we're going to kind of, you know, strap into your, your airplane seat. We're going to fly around the domain to a few little locations where I can show how we have teams on the ground and teams in the air. And I know with IARPIC, one of the goals is to kind of provide a, provide a, a topic in a way that people can talk about it afterwards. And so this is, as you're remembering what we've talked about today, it's, I think one of the one of the most important parts of the above campaign is the coordination of effort from the ground to the airplane and making sure that these teams can all work together across platforms and uh, across different locations in our very large domain here. So this is a, this is the, an area in the Northwest Territories. Uh, you can see on the right where the box is showing where we are. And then on the left, this is kind of a, a more detailed map showing Great Slave Lake and the L-band swaps where we took measurements this summer. And um, the little green dots are all of the different field locations. And some of those were sampled this summer, some were, were sampled other, other years as well, but uh, all as part of this, 
this overall effort. And we've had teams, uh, Michelle Mack and her team, Laura Bourgeau Chavez and her team, uh, Kevin Schaefer was out there this summer, and um, Nancy French had a, had a team as well. Um, so some of the, looking at fire disturbance in particular, Nancy Walker, part of Michelle Mack's team, she's just had a, a paper out, and uh, she actually gave a talk, um, I think, to this group, so I won't really delve into this, but just this was using field work in this region, and, and uh, that field work will, is being combined by others in looking at the airborne data as well. And uh, just to give you another shot of this location, here's Kakisa Lake, which is very near that Great Slave Lake location. And you can see the dots show all of the different field teams where they've been. And this is within an L-band swap. And this was a swap that was collected this summer. I was actually on the plane while this one was, was collected. And uh, in the lower right of the, uh, of, the, of the image, you can see kind of that mottled color. And that's an area that burned there. And uh, to go along with that, here's here's some of the team out in the field. We have uh, teams by Merit Tureksky, who is a, a collaborator of ours from Canada, looking at uh, doing permafrost cores in this in this same burned area. And uh, you can see what the core looks like. There's this really thick layer of um, of PD soil, and this this legacy carbon is can be vulnerable uh, to burning, and um, so that's something we're trying to investigate more as part of above. What, how vulnerable is it? Is it likely to burn? Also in this area, this is Kevin Schaefer's team. This is that Kikisa Lake area again. He's used the L-band SAR data to look at uh, fire-induced subsidence. And what you can see is that um, in areas where that have burned, which are in red on, on, these, on this uh, map, you have a higher level of subsidence than you do in areas that are unburned. And uh, Kevin was, uh, this is Kevin Schaefer's team that's done this work, and he was actually out in the Northwest Territories this summer, and he was interviewed by a uh, NASA communications team. And there's a nice uh, video that they've put together that kind of shows this, this carbon cycle in action in the Northwest Territories. And NASA's done actually quite a few of these videos uh, this year. They're called NASA Explorers Fires. And so this is season three, episode three, features Kevin Schaefer and the above team, and you can link to it there. And at the end of this talk, I've, I've got a slide that shows some other NASA communications um, videos and uh, I guess uh, little short stories that they've done featuring some of the above research if you want to check out more. Okay, so next we're going to fly to the north slope of Alaska. We're going to look at thermocarst and carbon release. This is work being done by Go Iwahana and his team. And uh, you can see where we are in red there, in that little red circle. And this is the Anaktuvik River fire, um, which um, happened uh, back in the 2000s. And it still has a very visible uh, impact on the landscape now. So this is an L-band SAR interferogram, which is where you've, we've taken measurements in the spring and in the fall. This was actually done in 2017, but some similar work was done this year as well. And you can look at vertical displacement. So how, as permafrost thaws or as the active layer um, it changes throughout the growing season, you can see changes in the, the height of the, uh, of the ground. And, um, and you can see that this vertical displacement is happening more in these burned areas, which are visible as uh, on the right, there are the, the darkened areas. And just showing you his team out in the field. Um, this is a, the area of the fire where they were is about 70 miles north of Tula Field Station. And they had uh, some, some GIS experts with drones come out with them on this field work and take some drone imagery. And that's on the right. And, and I just, just wanted to give you a, a, a perspective of what the landscape looks like and what some of the field work is, that is happening looks like. Next, we're going to zoom back out and look at the whole campaign just for a second. So this is going to be field work by Phil Townsend and his team. And uh, they are looking at foliar functional traits and how things like lignin and um, leaf mass area and um, other kind of aspects of, of, the, um, of the vegetation impact is, is affected 
by uh, change in the Arctic. So their research sites are in yellow on, these, on the map, and um, this, they're doing this in conjunction with the Avaris Next Generation Hyperspectral Imagery. And so that's in red on this map. And so overall, they had 246 plots with complete foliar chemistry plus spectra that they, that they took. And then in the bottom on the left there is, is a picture of their team, and they've taken it with their extra long selfie stick. So we're going to zoom into this uh, location in Cambridge Bay. And this is a uh, collaborative field work we've done with, the, with Polar Knowledge Canada. This is a group that we've partnered with in Canada, and uh, they're part of the Canadian government, and they've just opened a, a very nice research station up in Cambridge Bay. And that's the picture of it on the left. And on the right is kind of what the landscape looks like there. And Donald McLennan is, our, is one of our collaborat collaborators. And he's, he worked with Phil Townsend this summer and to do some field work at the same time as Avaris was able to go up there and fly over the area and make measurements. And so the town of Cambridge Bay is um, on, the, on the left of the image. You can see it where the red arrow is pointing towards it. And um, this is the Grenier watershed. And we uh, took a lot of avarice image over the imagery over this watershed. And then Phil Thompson's team went out and, and did quite a bit of, of uh, field work there. And he has a lot of, of, um, of great kind of images that you can look through. But I you know we wouldn't have time to kind of look at all of them here. So I, I've just shown this, this last one, which is, is kind of neat. Um, this shows the minimum noise fraction within this charged watershed, and you can get much more information than just red, green, and blue or a near IR composite. Um, the way they, they, that they're looking at things like, I think it's lignin, leaf mass area, and percent nitrogen as well, and they can come up with this kind of very colorful map. And all of this is, is really brought together to create these high resolution ecosystem classifications. And so this, from this, you're able to look at what's, what's unvegetated, what's, uh, where's water, what different types of vegetation are across this landscape. And so the teams in the field are, are looking at this, and then they're able to scale it up using, this, uh, using the adverse imagery and scale it to a larger part of the domain. OK. Next, I, I'm probably running, running low on time. So, I, I knew we wouldn't be able to kind of go throughout the domain and look at all of the different projects um, that, are, that are taking measurements, but I wanted to mention a few more. Carbon dynamics is a big part of the research that's going on. We are monitoring lake chemistry, looking at soil respiration, temperature, and moisture. That's Sunatali's project. Um, you can see a student here measuring organic layer depths in Nome Creek. We also work with a lot of flux tower measurements. and. Uh, Katie Walther, Anthony, and Chip Miller through his project, and she's working with him on his project, are looking at late carbon dioxide and methane concentrations. And they've, they've taken a lot of teams out this summer. They've, um, they used a snow machine, even though it was kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's not always snowy there. It's muddy, but they're still finding ways to get out to these lakes and understand what the, the carbon concentrations are in, within the lakes. Another interesting aspect of the research is looking at hydrology and permafrost dynamics. And um, this is, we're, we've partnered with uh, Burke Minsley and he's, uh, and Rob Striegel and others, um, looking at electrical resistivity tomography, ERT, and where you can look at, you can see that some of these areas are thawed at depth, uh, potentially leading to future thermocarst and coalescing bogs, perhaps. But um, this, we, uh, we actually went out with, with Burke uh, during the Alban campaign this, this uh, September. And Burke and his, and his team, Neil Pastic, were able to do this, these, uh, these NMR measurements. And then we had um, Matt McCander taking drone imagery. And then we did some soil moisture measurements as well, uh, trying to put all of these different pieces together at the time that the Alban instrument flew over. And uh, so this is a picture of us here uh, as we went out to take measurements. And one of the days we were in the field, we actually got to see the plane kind of, uh, it, it flies high, it's 41,000 feet. But as it was taking off, it kind of circled over where we were and we saw it flying over us, which is, which is very cool. So this is my, my last slide. And I wanted to point out here that uh, data from 
our campaign is available already. We have over 100 data products that are out. Some of this, the airborne data that I've mentioned, is available at this uh, web portal. And um, all of our the, the field data that is available will be here as well. And, and some of the field data and airborne data are still being processed as the, as the season just ended. Um, you can reach out to me by, on my, uh, at my email. Uh, Mike Falkowski also knows, knows a lot about this, more than I do sometimes. And our website and our Twitter and Facebook feed are here as well. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I think we'll, um, in the interest of making sure we get uh, Chris through his um, slides, maybe we can um, uh, have Steve introduce Chris next, and then we'll circle back if there's time left over for uh, for questions. Okay, great. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. And uh, just wanted to introduce uh, real quick Chris Heimstra with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Research and uh, Engineering Laboratory. Uh, Chris uh, has broad expertise and experience uh, related to snow modeling, and you may know uh, some of the work that he's done uh, that centers around um, observations and instrumentation approaches to understanding snow and permafrost change. Uh, but for the purposes of this group, he's also a, uh, you may not know, a trained botanist and plant ecologist as well. So uh, even though he doesn't uh, uh, necessarily highlight those uh, expertise all the time. Uh, we asked Chris to share some of his observations from field work this summer to highlight some of the types of very rapid change that we're experiencing here in Alaska. Uh, but I think also uh, there are going to be sprinkles of information about some of the challenges that uh, uh, people face as they're trying to understand these systems. So uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, please take it away. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, can you, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Right. Awesome. So uh, I'm just talking, uh, so a, a little bit of some of this summer, but a little bit of background context as well. Um, here we have some of the Fairbanks area uh, research sites that are going on. And for this one, I'll be talking mostly about uh, the tunnel site, which um, uh, Liz, I remember uh, taking you guys up around above the tunnel this summer, um, back in September. And uh, so, so here we are in, in the, the tunnel area, which is what I'll be mostly discussing uh, some of the work that goes on there. Um, and again, the big story, uh, we talk a lot about temperature um, and temperature trends and how important uh, rising temperatures are, but there's another story of the precipitation happening along with that. Um, and a lot of this work has actually come out of the last five or six years now of uh, above average precipitation in the, in the interior Alaska area. Um, so here's uh, 2014 where we have this uh, record year uh, for summer precip. And this is just June, June, July, and August. It's from 1980 to, to 2019. Um, and you can see this nice string of uh, six of the last years have had above average precip. Um, 14 was a big spike and it initiated a lot of the events um, that I'll be talking about uh, in a few moments. Um, but a lot of this stuff has sort of continued to build on this, um, and it really deals with the problem of a lot of summer water on these uh, frozen permafrost-dominated landscapes. Um, this is really the this is what kicked it off. Um, I we got a, a, over an inch of precipitation in July of 2014. It was like a single day record, um, not usual to get a big part or a, at least 10 or 15 percent of your annual precipitation in one day of the year. Um, and as a result of that, uh, this is like a, at the tunnel portal where we had a little bit of a waterfall uh, coming out of the, the bluff on the back end of that. This was uh, some of the original escarpment. So this was dug out in the probably the 30s and the 40s when they were doing gold mining. And after that, um, there are trails above the hill that sort of like route water. Uh, those trails turned into creeks and then routed water directly toward the tunnel itself. Um, and we've been dealing with this since that event, more or less. Uh, the Corps of Engineers and Krell has spent 
uh, over $300,000 on remediation activities for our 16-acre uh, site at, at the tunnel, um, just dealing with water and dealing with uh, trying to reroute that water. The water is not actually coming from our property. It's being routed to there from the neighbors, so the DNR, the state-owned lands up above. Um, and so that's causing some issues and, uh, and problems of, uh, of landscape uh, connectivity. In 2016, we've, um, some of the new part of the tunnel that was being dug was in, in, uh, threatened by some more thermocarsing that was happening over on the side um, based on uh, more water drainage issues. And again, really rapid, um, really immediate uh, activity. This isn't just localized just to the, the area of the tunnel itself, up in the Glen Creek watershed, which is uh, straight to the east of the tunnel, a few kilometers. You find uh, evidence of thermocarsting here on the left, and on the right, uh, there's some even some die-off that's now starting to, to show up in changes where black spruce, it's too wet for black spruce, there's still ongoing Glutification, some moss invasion in some areas because the drainages themselves, because of the thermocarsting, are actually changing and migrating around. Um, some of the challenge in dealing with this is that if you set up instrumentation in certain creeks or certain areas that show up, um, you might in, like plant some uh, temperature sensors or what have you, cameras uh, there and then come back later to find that the water no longer flows there. It's migrated a, a couple hundred meters away um, and it's flowing elsewhere on the landscape. So there's a lot of uh, movement in where the stream drainages go. Uh, coming up into this year, this year we had a kind of an unusual event early August where um, we kind of had an atmospheric river for interior Alaska happening over the course of two to two days in, in early August. Um, so here on the left, we have Glen Creek, which is usually has a lot less water flowing in it, and there's active thermocarsting and sliding and erosion happening along the margins of that creek. Um, and here you can see where part of the, the bank has just collapsed in. This is exposed permafrost now where there's water that's actively ru running down the sides of this um, area and dripping in there. There are also some open cavities, some places where um, the water just flows into the side, into the hole, and then disappears, and then comes up a, a, like 10 meters downstream. Um, really unusual, um, pretty wild, and um, increasingly uh, an issue. Um, also in that same watershed, there's some interesting uh, thermocarst lakes. Um, these lakes have been around. They're identified. Um, in some reports from the 70s that I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, and this is one of the lakes that's up there. It's uh, impressive to see when you walk through the, the forest, it's even when you're 30 meters away, you'd never uh, think that there is a, not an insubstantial pond that's sitting there. And this has grown um, probably at least 20 to 30% in size since the mid 80s. And there's active thermocarsting happening around the edge and then around the outlets of that, um, of that area. So um, at, on the front end of this, back in May of 2014, we were able to get some um, Corps of Engineers money to, to do LIDAR data collections over a bunch of sites, including the tunnel. Um, this was done before the 2014 summer uh, when we got a lot of the rain. And we've been able to get LIDAR data sets that happen periodically after that. Uh, NASA G Light in 2014 was there um, and flew a swath over the tunnel um, as a part of the above stuff, which uh, isn't shown in here. They continually use and fly over the tunnel and collect data. We paid for another data set in 2016. And then the, the state of Alaska had another data collection in summer of 2017. And we're able to difference all of these with the 2014 data set to look at thermocarsting happening. Overall, you can see that it, it tends to, the, the most erosion tends to happen in very localized areas. Um, and here's another little view with uh, some worldview imagery behind it. Um, 
the creek beds and the ravines that are really close to where that escarpment is or where the most dramatic erosion occurs. This is where some of the new erosion is occurring that's dropped and it's one to two meters of loss in that narrow band. And a lot of this is spurred from water change and water flow pattern changes that happen up above in the watershed and also um, Frankly, a lot of the trails are rerouting a lot of water in different places because of uh, erosion issues um, and general abuse. And you can see the main ch uh, channel of Glen Creek itself, um, where there are definitely hot pockets of erosion activity. And that lake that I pointed out a little while ago is right here, where you can see the margins of that lake are growing. Um, oh, another interesting aspect is you can see here there's a, some large blue area. This is actually where a lot of the silt that is washing out of this watershed ends up being deposited. So we're getting a, a, a gain in elevation there happening because of that. Um, and this is also causing a, a few issues downstream. There are ponds and things that people have had or on their personal property for habitat, and now um, those are be becoming uh, filled with sediment um, pretty much every summer as a result. Um, so it's, it's definitely uh, got widespread issues that, that seem to be emerging. I'm getting into the research history. So um, the, the tunnel was put in in the 60s and, a, and coincident with that were some really initial and pioneering watershed studies that happened in boreal landscapes. This is the V-notch weir, the original structure um, that was put in in the mid-60s in the watershed. And Dingman uh, did his uh, PhD dissertation work in that and had a number of reports describing uh, boreal forest landscape, uh, water budgets, snow measurements, and precipitation measurements uh, from that, um, all done um, through Corral back in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, so it's, a, it's been used as a watershed, a research site for some time. There are a lot of observations there. And one other thing that I was able to do um, was actually revisit or uh, take a look and try to re-photograph some particular areas here. Uh, so here's the V-notch weir that I showed in that previous photo. And you can see it in place here shortly, shortly after its installation. Um, and you can look at the other bank here where a lot of that's disturbed from the construction. Uh, some of the support structures here, the pilings that they drove in like 12 feet into the, into the permafrost uh, for support. And then there's a meteorological station set up here with some gauges and, and so on. But the big thing to get here is that you can see these trees that are here. Um, and it's mostly open, uh, probably shrubby boreal meadow here. And now to re-photograph that, this was taken last October. Um, I think you can see the original trees that you can see over here are still there, um, but the forest is really filled in on quite a bit with uh, other trees um, where the landscape looks very different. You can walk over there and find the original um, sort of platforms that these met data uh, towers and shelters were constructed on. They're still over here on the other side. And in, in Dingman's report, um, they said that they could, they had evidence that, that showed that the fire that had happened in this basin uh, was not recorded, but um, a lot of the tree growth and everything happened like 1900 to 1905. Um, and then it's been slowly sort of revegetating and, and black spruce has been taken over after that. Um, so again, an interesting, uh, uh, look to see how um, over time, you know, from year to year, things tend to not change that much, but you add that up pretty quickly. Um, and also, I've been looking at ways to, to use high resolution satellite data to look at corresponding changes in NDVI to see at what sort of thresholds do we start seeing some of these uh, trends that you that are obvious in the LIDAR data. Do they show up in the imagery as the plants react to uh, what's happening there, and you can definitely see some of the stream network um, has had a decrease in NDVI from that time period um, in there, as well as uh, increases in, a, in another variety of places. In a lot of the silt deposition, you see a lot of invasion by pretty rapid growing grasses. 
Um, and that, uh, while I haven't specifically looked at that, that's definitely uh, something that's on the radar and worth looking at. And I'll take a few moments to start focusing a little bit on um, one of the big gaps in, in dealing with permafrost landscapes, which is the snow aspect. A lot of the year, uh, most of the boreal forest looks like this. And this sort of canopy snow feedback structures that you can see. And then last year in particular, because we had such a late snow arrival, uh, there were really substantial voids in the snowpack at that uh, vegetation snow interface that may or may not have a role in uh, soil temperatures. In dealing with permafrost landscapes, one of the big unknowns is what that impact of snow is. And one way, since we uh, have land there and can do manipulations and run experiments there, um, you can notice that trees actually intercept a lot of the snow and prevent it from uh, sitting at the base of the of the trees, and this is, has some likely uh, thermal impacts. So we set up an experiment that happened last year, and that we're repeating again this year, um, where we intercepted snow artificially with a a very complicated piece of uh, plywood, and held that over the snowpack. Unfortun fortunately, in this area, we don't have any wind. Um, so we're able to do this and able to keep the snow away from that snowpack. Um, so we have uh, thermistors that are set at 5 centimeters below the surface and 35 centimeters below the surface. And you can see that uh, as the time goes on, the, uh, the control is the, the one that's covered with snow and the denial is the one without. You see colder temperatures at both levels in the denial. And then uh, here is in March, like early March is when the snow started melting out this year and we removed that uh, plywood and uh, uh, wanted to see what was going to happen after that. And interestingly, there's like a lag here that lasts well into the summer uh, for some reason in the denial um, before they sort of meet together and converge in August. Uh, so the impact of snow seems to be pretty dramatic. Um, and again, we'll take a look at this again this year as we run the identical experiment again. Um, and talking a little bit about uh, SnowX, so I've been involved with SnowX since 2016 um, and helping to run a lot of this will take us away from Alaska and start focusing a little bit on Western Colorado, uh, where a combination of remote sensing instrumentation um, is looking at snow distributions on these landscapes and trying to quantify the amount of snow water equivalent here through a coordinated aerial ground approach, also using high resolution imagery and satellite imagery to try to gather uh, snow information also coordinated with ground experiments. And this, uh, in this coming up year, um, thanks to the shutdown and a, a year of hiatus that was built in there, it's been a little while since we've been able to carry out an experiment. But this uh, coming winter, this is the plan. It's uh, five western states and 13 different sites scattered among them that will have uh, biweekly measurements from El Bansar. Uh, that, that are happening along with a coordinated um, high resolution Grand Mesa intensive observation period from late January into early February. And the goal, or eventually, uh, we hope, uh, or at least I hope, to bring this approach to Alaska and try to address some of the key snow issues that are happening up here. And here I have some of the linking. Um, these different data sets um, and trying to address that convergence between snow, um, land cover impacts, and permafrost, um, which is a, a huge issue and probably one of the big wild cards in where uh, these permafrost landscapes are going. Uh, so um, looking at canopy issues, uh, remote sensing issues fundamentally, um, and getting at that really messy snow boundary uh, part of the effectiveness of, of these ecosystem protected permafrost landscapes is that that boundary is so um, such a good insulation layer. And that, that sort of same aspect also presents some challenges when you're trying to look at snow and elevation 
um, and how you do most of your snow measurements, which is by differencing surfaces, like with LIDAR structure from motion. Um, also, uh, looking at canopy succession, um, uh, thaw properties, the changing landscape, those void spaces that I talked about, and some of the other aspects of there. It's a really challenging environment to do snow measurements, um, challenging to move around, um, and one of the big things that that needs to be addressed in trying to advance uh, global snow remote sensing work. And this is in, in canopy snow interactions and freeze thaw, thaw status. And this is my last slide. And so, uh, yeah, open it up for discussion if we have time. Thanks, Chris. Much appreciated. I think uh, Steve had to run off to another call. Um, but uh, thanks to both of our speakers. We can stick around and run a couple minutes late. Meredith says we've got the the, uh, the line for a little bit longer. If anybody wants to ask specific questions for either of you, um, we can go ahead and do that. Chris, why do you think there was that lag in, in the denial, uh, the, the snow denial area like why was there a lag in that warming i i don't um i'm not entirely sure i think it might be that the that the vegetation may have been um may have had a delay in actually coming up but it was kind of like it leveled out entirely and it may have to do with water or water flow from the sides uh, we have less control over the water than we do with the snow Okay. Um, so it's a, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure or sold on, on why that existed. Um, I think I'm going to have to invest in a bunch of plywood now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've always wanted to do that, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I, we need to do something a little more controlled than that, um, or at least try to like look at that sort of really fine scale canopy impact and thermal regulation. Um, which might be why black spruce is so effective in in keeping things cold in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. So, Liz, I had a question. Do you do you know anything about the um, the potential LNS band SAR data collections that are happening up here in a, maybe in December? Yeah, that's with uh, the Indian Space Agency, right? Yes. I believe that they're on track to do that. Um, I think uh, Chip's been in, Chip Miller's been in contact with that group somehow or knows a little bit more about it, and he's mentioned it. I don't know, Mike, if you... Yeah, there's, there's been some delay, I think, in getting okay. the, the LNS band system approved for installation of the NASA plane, but I had heard yesterday in our staff meeting that that has gone forward. I don't know if it's just the approval or if they've actually mounted it, but it's it's a positive step in the right direction. And so that should be happening soon. Um, I don't, Gerald Bodwin would be the one to talk to in terms of specific areas that are being flown. If you don't know that, Chris, I am not aware of what specific areas are being flown yet, but we could, we could email Gerald to find out. Well, I'm, I'm on, so I, I, uh, I had been lobbying for um, some of the sites that I showed in that other image and I'm, I'm now in that group. Um, and there, I know there's a phone call on Monday, but I, I don't know who else who's arguing for like Alaska stuff or the revisit of above sites or. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I can follow up with Gerald um, either tomorrow or Monday, but I know that he is, you know, he had been working with people like Chip Miller to make sure that some of the above interests and the above sites were, were represented in where they're collecting data. I mean, All right. part of Part of it is the Indian Space Agency has other objectives that they're interested in, in looking at as well. So but I think there will be some coordination of, of trying to hit some of our targets of interest as they're in route or on the way back from some of their targets of interest as well. Um, so I think it's there's been a fair bit of coordination on that. Um, and so I, I don't know the status of it, but I can get back to you. Yeah, it'd be good to know like what other sites are of interest. Um, I'm still sort of like uh, trying to grapple with the possibility of maybe trying to get um, field some ground 
observations that can work with that on like super short notice and during the week of AGU. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Um, I will email Daryl. I'll see what I can find out for you. All right, thanks. Yep. Okay, if there are no other questions or uh, collaborative uh, missives, then um, I think we'll go ahead and, and close and respect people's time. We're already five over. I want to thank um, Meredith for helping organize and both our speakers uh, uh, for providing insights into their really cool stuff um, and also for everybody on the phone for attending. And um, we look forward to seeing you again. Meredith, do you have anything else? Just to note that this meeting is recorded and the recording along with the notes will be posted um, next week. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you.